presented last Tuesday evening the annual Quest Medals at Edwards University. The Quest Medals results, do you know that? It appears now that we have a practical means for inducing antibody formation to poliomyelitis virus. That is, to the three types of poliomyelitis uh, virus. Now, this antibody is the substance uh, that is present in the bloodstream that is presumed uh, to furnish protection. Have you found any ill effects at all from it? There haven't been any whatever. We've had neither sore arms, nor any fever, nor aching, nor any of the usual things that one sometimes in, uh, encounters, uh, even with diphtheria immunization and tetanus immunization and the other immunizations uh, that are given to children. Before 1955, families lived in constant fear as children were left paralyzed, trapped in machines just to breathe and unable to move. This was called polio. Watching loved ones suffer like this, often with no hope of recovery, was a nightmare. But then came a brilliant mind like a savior who changed the fate of humanity forever. Not only that, this man gave it all away for the greater good. What happened next didn't just transform his life. It changed the entire world. For example, polio, once feared for its deadly epidemics, is no longer a threat in the modern world. This isn't just a story about innovation. It's about courage, sacrifice, and the power of a single decision. Stick around to uncover the shocking truth behind his choice and its ripple effect on humanity. The polio epidemic now. Well, cancer has many causes. And, uh, uh, Polio is much simpler in that a virus in fact uh, modifies in the intestinal tract and while the bloodstream gets to the brain and spinal cord and there the problem is simply that of providing a blockade of antibody in the bloodstream that prevents invasion of the nervous system or uh, spread to others uh, in the population by the same means. Polio is merely a disease that's mostly a memory thanks to vaccines. But in the early 20th century, polio turned lives upside down. Back then, people didn't fully understand what they were dealing with, and major polio outbreaks were unheard of before 1900. There were small, scattered cases, but nothing like the chaos that followed. The first known report of multiple cases was in 1843, describing an outbreak in Louisiana two years earlier. Then, there was silence, a 50-year gap, until a small cluster of cases appeared in Boston in 1893. The real alarm bells started ringing in 1894, when Vermont faced what's now considered the first U.S. polio epidemic. It hit 132 people, killed 18, and even affected some adults. From there, the situation snowballed. By 1907, New York City alone reported 2,500 cases. It wasn't just a disease, it was a nightmare. Just imagine, a simple cardboard placard slapped on a house meant someone inside had polio. It warned neighbors to stay away, and if you dared remove it, you'd face a hefty fine, $100 back then, equivalent to several thousand dollars today. This was much like today's COVID-19 pandemic and social distancing, wasn't it? Parents lived in dread every summer, terrified their child might wake up with a headache, and hours later, be paralyzed. Polio didn't just paralyze legs, if it climbed high enough up the spine, it could stop you from breathing. Summers became a season of fear. One of the scariest outbreaks hit Brooklyn in 1916. On June 17th, the city declared there was an epidemic and things spiraled fast. By the end of that year, polio had infected 27,363 people across the US and killed 7,130. In New York City alone, over 2,000 lives were lost. Daily newspapers printed names and addresses of those infected. Their homes were marked and families were quarantined. Schools, movie theaters, and public gatherings were all canceled. Even simple joys like swimming pools and beaches became no-go zones for kids. Polio wasn't just a US problem. It spread to Canada and the UK with serious outbreaks in the 1940s and 50s. The 1952 epidemic in the U.S. was the worst, leaving 57,628 people infected, over 3,000 dead, and more than 21,000 paralyzed. The fear was so intense that it sparked a massive push for a vaccine. It's wild to think how something as simple as improved sanitation inadvertently made things worse. 
cleaner water and better sewage systems meant children weren't exposed to the virus early on, when their immune systems could handle it better. By the time they encountered it later in life, it was far deadlier. Dr. Jonas Salk. In a few months after I arrived in Pittsburgh, I was visited by the director of the research of the National Foundation for Infant Paralysis, asking if I would be willing to participate in a program on typing polioviruses. Well, I'd had no experience in working with polio, but this provided me with an opportunity just as the work on influenza did. And so I uh, uh, seized upon that opportunity. It gave me a chance to get funds, to get laboratory facilities, uh, to get equipment, to hire staff, uh, and to build up something that was not there. It uh, also uh, would provide me with an opportunity to learn about how you work with poliovirus. Well, it was in the course of that experience, which was looked upon by most people as just a routine drudgery. It wasn't that way to me because instantly I saw that there were more efficient ways of typing viruses than were, were proposed by those who, were, who set forth the protocol that I was supposed to follow. And so it didn't take long for them to realize, as well as myself, that I saw the world differently and I could make things work more efficiently and effectively. Uh, in the course of that work, uh, it became obvious to me that uh, it, we had the ways and means for uh, moving ahead toward vaccine development because of new discoveries that were made. Uh, we knew there were three types of virus, uh, and as well, Ern Robbins at Harvard had just grown virus in tissue culture. And so I didn't delay, didn't waste any time. We just picked up these methods and techniques and began to advance them even farther ahead than those who initiated the work. During this frightening time, Jonas Salk emerged, a name that became synonymous with hope and triumph over a devastating disease. Born on October 28, 1914 in New York City, Jonas grew up as a regular kid with big dreams. He was smart, determined, and had a curiosity that set him apart. After graduating from the City College of New York, he went on to study medicine at New York University, paving the way for a career that would leave an indelible mark on the world. In 1947, Salk found himself at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine, where he was given his own lab. It wasn't much, smaller than he hoped, and full of restrictive rules, but it was enough to get started. The following year, Harry Weaver, the director of research at the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, reached out to Salk with a critical task, figure out how many types of polio existed. With this mission, Salk received additional funding, lab space, and a dedicated team. He recruited brilliant minds like Julius Jungner, Byron Bennett, and Lorraine Friedman, and with their help, Salk began building a world-class virology lab, the Breakthrough. At the time, the polio epidemic was already striking fear into families across the globe. It paralyzed children, disrupted lives, and caused heartbreak on an unimaginable scale. Salk was determined to change that. Before Jonas Salk developed the polio vaccine, other researchers also tried, but several scientific challenges prevented them from creating an effective solution. One of the primary obstacles was the complexity of the virus itself. Polio is caused by the poliovirus, an RNA virus, which was difficult to isolate and study due to its nature. Early virologists struggled to understand its structure, and the virus could only be cultured in human tissue or living animals, making research slow and labor-intensive. Additionally, the inability to grow the virus in laboratory conditions posed a significant hurdle. Early attempts to cultivate the virus in non-human tissues or cell lines failed, which limited research and testing capabilities. It was only in the 1930s, with the development of reliable monkey kidney cell cultures, that researchers could successfully grow the virus in a lab setting, laying the groundwork for vaccine development. Ethical and safety concerns also played a crucial role in slowing progress. Testing potential vaccines involved risks, particularly the possibility of introducing a live virus to human subjects. This made it difficult to test vaccines using live or attenuated viruses, as there was always a chance the virus could cause disease. The lack of an effective, safe method for testing was a significant barrier. Moreover, the scientific community had a limited understanding of the immune system's response to viruses, 
The concept of using inactivated, killed viruses to induce immunity, an approach Salk would later adopt, was not well established. But Jonas Salk overcame these obstacles through his innovative approach. While others, like Albert Sabin, were working on a live virus vaccine, Salk believed a killed virus vaccine would be safer. His approach wasn't without risks, but he pressed on, testing his vaccine on animals before moving to humans. He developed the first successful polio vaccine by using an inactivated, killed, version of the virus. By inactivating the polio virus with formaldehyde, Salk was able to create a vaccine that could stimulate the immune system without causing the disease. This was a critical breakthrough, as earlier efforts to develop vaccines using live, weakened viruses were considered too risky. Salk also utilized monkey kidney cells to culture large quantities of the polio virus, a method that had not been successfully applied before. This allowed him to generate sufficient viral material to create the vaccine. His rigorous testing process involved both animal and human trials to ensure the vaccine's safety and efficacy. The success of these trials led to the mass vaccination campaigns of the mid-1950s, demonstrating the vaccine's effectiveness in preventing polio. Salk's work was further supported by collaboration with other researchers and significant funding from organizations such as the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, March of Dimes, and the US government. This backing enabled large-scale testing and distribution of the vaccine. It became the largest clinical trial in history, involving over 1.8 million children. Initially, in 1952, Salk conducted his first human trials, injecting 43 children at the D.T. Watson home for crippled children. A few weeks later, he expanded testing to other groups, even vaccinating his own kids in 1953, a bold move that showed his confidence in the vaccine's safety. The turning point came in 1954, when Salk's vaccine was tested on nearly a million children, known as the polio pioneers. On April 12, 1955, the results were announced. The vaccine was safe, effective, and ready to change the world. But what made Salk truly extraordinary wasn't just his invention. It was what he did next. The billion dollar question. Who owns the patent on this vaccine? Well, the, the people, I, I would say, there is no patent. This is, could you patent the sun? Salk wasn't someone who sought fame or glory. He was a scientist who cherished his independence and privacy. But when his groundbreaking vaccine was announced, staying under the radar became impossible. Ed Murrow, the famous television personality, summed it up best. Young man, a great tragedy has befallen you. You've lost your anonymity. Murrow once asked Salk a question that stuck with people for generations. Who owns this patent? Salk's answer was profound. The people, I would say. There is no patent. Could you patent the sun? That statement wasn't just poetic. It reflected Salk's core belief that the vaccine belonged to humanity. Many researchers speculated the vaccine could have been worth $7 billion if patented. Lawyers at the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis determined that prior research made it unpatentable. But for Salk, it didn't matter. His mission wasn't profit. It was saving lives. Fame and its challenges. As one of the few scientists whose face was recognized around the world, Salk became a kind of celebrity he never wanted. John Cohen described it perfectly. Salk had a superstar aura. Pilots announced his presence on flights and passengers would erupt in applause. Restaurants? Forget about eating in peace. Fans often approached him mid-meal. Hotels upgraded him to their finest suites. Even scientists and journalists who worked closely with him couldn't help but be awestruck when they first met him. However, all this attention weighed heavily on Salk. A few months after his vaccine announcement, the New York Times noted his struggles, writing that he was appalled at the demands of being a public figure. At 40, Salk had gone from being unknown to a folk hero. Yes, he received numerous accolades, a presidential citation, honorary degrees, and international honors but the relentless spotlight left him yearning for the quiet of his lab. He often spoke about stepping away from fame, saying it felt inappropriate for a scientist to be in the public eye. Reflecting on it years later, Salk admitted, it's as if I've been public property ever since. Ethical Legacy. 
to the whole world, and particularly to pharmaceutical companies, Salk's choice was shocking. By not patenting the vaccine, he essentially gave away an estimated $7 billion in potential profits. It was an act of selflessness almost unheard of in the modern era. What makes Salk's decision even more remarkable is how it contrasts with how things work today. In the modern world, pharmaceutical companies rely heavily on patents to maintain exclusive rights to their drugs, often charging sky-high prices. Some life-saving treatments today cost tens of thousands of dollars a year, making them unaffordable for many. But Salk's decision meant his vaccine could be manufactured and distributed cheaply and quickly, saving countless lives without waiting for profits. Of course, not everyone agreed with his decision. Critics argued that he was missing out on money that could have funded additional research. Others thought he was too humble and should have taken credit or financial rewards for his work. But Salk remained firm. Fighting polio wasn't about personal gain. He believed it was a team effort and people's well-being mattered far more than money or fame. The results speak for themselves. Thanks to Salk's vaccine, polio cases worldwide have dropped by more than 99%. What used to be hundreds of thousands of cases annually is now just a few dozen. His decision demonstrated the incredible outcomes possible when science focuses on helping people rather than maximizing profit. Salk's vaccine changed history and set a shining example of generosity and ethical responsibility. Salk had become a symbol of hope. The development of the vaccine was made possible by public donations to the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, now known as the March of Dimes, and over 650,000 kids participated in trials. It was a collective effort, funded by $50 million in donations. Salk's quote, Could you patent the sun? has since become a symbol of the idealistic side of science. It's often used to critique the way pharmaceutical companies prioritize profit over public health. However, the reality is a bit more complicated. Salk's statement specifically applied to the polio vaccine, which had already been funded by public donations. Legal experts later confirmed that the vaccine wasn't patentable because it wasn't considered new enough under patent laws. The foundation had already decided to share the formula freely to prioritize public health. Salk's belief that vaccines are natural and should be treated differently from other inventions reflects a powerful ideal. However, modern vaccines involve advanced scientific engineering. In today's world, vaccine development often requires significant investment, mixing contributions from government, nonprofits, and corporations. Patents can help incentivize innovation while ensuring accessibility. Interestingly, later in life, Salk started a company to develop an HIV vaccine and sought patents for it. He recognized that research requires financial backing, even if his ideals about accessibility remained the same. So, the real challenge isn't whether vaccines should be patented, but how to build a system that fosters innovation while ensuring life-saving treatments are accessible to all. That's a balance the world is still striving to achieve. The vaccine's global impact. Dr. Jonas Salk changed the world in ways many people don't fully appreciate. Imagine being a kid in the 1950s and not knowing if you'd wake up one day and suddenly be unable to walk. That was the terrifying reality before the polio vaccine. 